How would you answer that? Anyone care to volunteer? Well, that's great. If everything's perfectly clear, we're, we're doing great then. Well, again, don't hesitate to ask if you have questions. Um, based on what I saw on the last assignment that I graded, people were, for the most part, on, on the right track. Um, a few tweaks here and there, perhaps. But I know that as we start talking more about objects and object references and classes, that some things are liable to be confusing, so, so don't hesitate to ask. So far, we've been talking about individual pizzas and about like making a pizza and asking how much it costs, um, creating the methods, etc. What I'd like to do now is um, take a stab at creating an order, a complete order for a pizza. So if we were to think about it, if you place an order at a pizza place, we want to design a class for an order, all right? And a class has attributes and it has methods. It has instance variables, sometimes they're called, or properties, sometimes they're called. And it also has methods or functions or behaviors, sometimes it's called. Let's think about a pizza order. And remember, what's relevant, um, you know, we have to decide what's relevant for our particular application. All right. What, what would be something that would be contained in a pizza order class? We'll just call it an order class. What would be something that would be contained in that? If not, I'll assign homework this weekend of everyone going and placing an order at a pizza place and see if you can determine from that what some of the attributes are. Because really, that's, that's what we're doing here. Is we're creating a model of a real life thing. We're creating a model in software of a real life thing. So if you were to look at a receipt from a pizza place or what the pizza uh, clerk writes down when they take an order or anything like that, you're off to a good start. So what would be an attribute or a method associated with an order from a pizza place? Cost, total cost, all right? I'm just going to write these things down, and we're not going to talk about whether they're an attribute or a method right off. So we have total cost. All right, toppings. Interesting thing is, is a topping an attribute of an order, in other words, I'm placing this order and I want this order with pepperoni. My order, I want, I want my order topped with pepperoni and mushrooms. Not really. What is topped with pepperoni and mushrooms? It's the attribute of one pizza. In other words, I could have a pizza topped with pepperoni, and I could have pizza topped with mushrooms. And I could have one without any toppings. So toppings, I would not say, are an attribute of an order. Toppings are an attribute of a pizza. But I think you're on the right track when you think of, of pepperoni and, and other toppings. Because what does an order contain? Yes? A type of pizza? Ah, exactly. It contains a certain number of pizzas. It doesn't just contain like the number, all right, although you could, you could calculate the number, but um, it, it actually contains a list of pizzas. In other words, if I were to call into Pizza Hut right now, I would say I want a large pepperoni, I want a small plain, and a medium with mushrooms. So there's actually three pizzas on my order, right? And that's important, because I need to get charged for those three pizzas. The delivery person, when they leave, they probably want to check to make sure they're carrying three boxes so that they know that there's three pizzas in that order, and so on. So how would we say that? I would say a pizza 
contains, the way I would describe it is I would say a pizza contains a list, oh, I'm sorry, an order contains a list of pizzas. Now here's the good news. We already have a pizza class, right? So we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We don't need to reinvent something in the order that says that, you know, this is how you make a pizza. We already have a pizza class. We just need a list of these pizzas for our order. Okay? What's another attribute? Person's name. Another attribute. Sales tax, if there's any. Um, other pickup time. time, whether it's for delivery or not. Um, I would say we can add to this phone number and address because they always ask you your phone number and then they always ask you for an ad well they ask you for an address if it's for delivery and so on we could probably come up with a with a with a more comprehensive list but this is a great start all right um, and we're going to implement this a little bit at a time so we're not going to do everything all at once all right we're going to maybe add some of the basic functionality to this and then we're going to go and extend it like maybe for delivery, there's a $2 extra charge. So if you, if you get your pizzas to, to be delivered, your cost for the, for the order is $2 plus um, whatever the cost of the pizzas are, and so on. All right. Um, we could have eat, uh, eat uh, dine-in, or, or carry-out, too, if it was a place that was a sit-down restaurant. Um, but anyhow, those are, those are pretty much the properties um, that we're going to have. Let me rephrase that. These are not all properties, right? Which one of these do you think would be better as methods as opposed to properties? In other words, which one of these do you think are calculated and which one of, them, which one of these things simply has a value? Total cost, what about it? This will be calculated. So this won't be an attribute that will set and get, right? We're not going to say I'm going to create an order for pizza and the cost is $25, right? We're going to create an order for a for we're going to create an order, we're going to add some pizzas to that order, and then we're going to say, "Hey, here's what the total cost is." And how do we get the total cost? By summing up the cost of the individual pizzas. And Maybe, if there's a delivery charge, we add the delivery charge on top of that. All right? Um, what else is going to be calculated? Pickup time probably will be calculated. All right? We had a bake time attribute. All right? Now, I guess that depends on our assumptions about how big the oven is at the pizza place. Can we, how many pizzas can we bake at a time? You know, but we could do some kind of math calculation and calculate, gee, if, you know, if, if the pizza takes 12 minutes to make, then, well, it's going to be ready 12 minutes from now, assuming it could go in the oven right away. All right. But anyhow, that would be calculated. Sales tax would be calculated because sales tax is based on the total cost and so on. Now. How many pizzas could someone order? There's no answer to that, right? Depends how hungry you are, all right? Depends how many people are there, all right? And so on. Depends if you want to do like I do and order enough so that there'll be leftovers for dinner the next day, right? Um, so the number of pizzas could just be one. Right? One person could just order a pizza. If, a, you know, if you're ordering for a family, it could be two or three pizzas, depending, you know, me and my brothers get together, it better be three or four pizzas, right? Uh, if you're ordering for a party, it could be ten pizzas, all right? The idea is, is we don't really know how many pizzas are going to be on that order. 
All right. Now, we dealt with arrays in the beginning of this class when we did the random number thing with the Mad Lib. All right. And there's a little bit of a drawback with arrays. The drawback with arrays is this. You have to specify the, the, the size of the array um, when you create the array. So that's not really good, because we don't know how big to make the array, because we don't know how many pieces there are. Now, we could do something silly and make the array have 100 elements in it, because no one's going to order more than 100 pieces, probably. But that would kind of be wasteful, in a way. Um, so we're going to need something other than an array to take care of our list of pizzas. Because our list of pizzas, again, normally when we see list, we think an array. But our list of pizzas is a variable amount, right? Our list of pizzas for just one person ordering could be one pizza. Our list for a party could be 12 pizzas, and so on. You don't know. Every time someone makes an order, there could be a different number. Therefore, we're not going to use an array. We're going to be use something called an array list. The array list has the advantage of an array over an array that it can expand and contract. All right? So you can make an array list bigger simply by adding a new item to the end of the list, and the list will expand. So we're going to use an array list to contain a list of pieces. All right? So let's talk about what we're going to do first off. We talked about there being several things uh, here on, on this list. Um, let's, let's create our order class, and let's talk about what we're going to accomplish in this first pass. We should be able to get this first pass done today, or at least mostly today. In our order class, we're going to create an attribute of name, an attribute of address, an attribute of phone number, and a list of pizzas, and a boolean that says whether it's delivery or not. I'm going to create two constructors, all right? One constructor that accepts a name and a phone number, and sets the address to pick up, the word pick up. Or actually, it leaves the address blank. And it says delivery to false. I'm going to create a second constructor that has a name, phone number, an address. And it's going to set delivery to true. So that's my, those are my two constructors. And we could do this a bunch of different ways. I'm just sort of trying to think of some way that we could do this that might be a little different. We've talked about constructors, and we've talked about constructor with defaults, and, and so on. All right? We need the ability to add a pizza to the order. In other words, the customer says, I want a large with pepperoni. We need to add a large pepperoni pizza to the order. We want a small with mushrooms. We need to be able to add a small with mushrooms to the order, and so on down the line. Then finally, we need to calculate the total cost. Now, what's the total cost? It's going to be the total of the pizza's individual cost plus a $2 fee if delivery. 
All right, so we, we already have a, a function to calculate the cost of a pizza. So we're going to add up the cost of all the pizzas that are on that order. And then we're going to add $2 to the order if it is delivery. That's what my aim is to create today. All right? That's what I aim to create today. And, and hopefully we'll be able to do that. So let me go and download the last thing that we did. All right, here we have, so I'm going to create my order class. Let's open up the unit test, and let's open up the pizza class. So I'm going to create a new class for orders. Now I'm going to start out by saying import Java util array list. If something isn't in the basic functionality of Java then you have to import the class. You have to tell it like which class you you want to use. All right. So that's essentially what the import statement does. We haven't done anything, we haven't done anything with this so far because we haven't needed to. We've just used classes that we've created and just the basic classes of Java. So I'm going to create a public class called order. And it's going to have attributes which are private. Private string name private string phone private string address private boolean is delivery. And then finally I'm going to create my array list of pizzas. And the syntax for this is a little different than we've seen before. We have the name of the class which is array list. We have then in these slanted brackets, these less than and greater than signs, what object is going to be contained. What objects are going to be contained in our array list. And in this case, I am creating an array list that contains pizzas. So I can specify when I create an array list, let me put this on two different lines. I can specify when I create an array list what I'm going to put into that array list. And that's good because then it won't allow me to put anything else in that array list. So this array list is only for pizzas. If we were a shop that sold other stuff too, we'd have to design this a little bit differently. But for now, all we sell is pizzas, so my array list is going to contain only pizzas. So, I have an array list that contains pizzas, that contains pizza objects, 
and the name of the array list is pizzas. Okay? I'm going to create my two constructors here. And what I say? One would contain a name and a phone number. And I'm going to set those attributes to the argument. So when I create this object using this constructor, it will initialize the phone and the name. And if you only give a name and a phone number when you place an order, I'm going to assume that it's not a delivery, right? Because you need to give an address if it's delivery. So I'm going to say is delivery equals false. So if I use this constructor, it's going to assume that it is not for delivery. I'm going to add another argument to this constructor for the address. And if this constructor is used, then I set the address to the argument. And I set delivery to true. Okay? Simple enough. I'm going to now create a method to add a pizza to this order. All right? So I'm going to create the method and I'm going to leave some blanks. And we're going to try to fill in those blanks. First of all, what do you think our argument to this add pizza method is going to be? Pardon me? Well, not a quantity, because it's really not enough to say I'm placing an order for three pizzas. You need to know the specifics. You need to add to the order the specifics of the pizza. Because if you only know that there's three pizzas, um, you can't really charge it because different size pizzas with different toppings get charged a different thing. So if I'm adding a pizza to the order, what is going to be my argument? Okay. Okay, exactly. Our argument, when we need to add to the list of pizzas is the actual pizza that they've chosen. In other words, with all the parameters, whether it's thin or thick crust, small, medium, or large, with or with pepperoni. Now, this is what throws some students, because students are used to writing functions where the arguments are like simple things, like strings or, or numbers or booleans or something like that. But we're actually going to pass as an argument to this function a pizza object. All right. So my test class is going to make a pizza. All right. It's going to get, and again, assuming this was from a user interface, let's imagine it was a user interface, we would have a place to enter in the name, phone number, address. We would have a place to add a pizza to the order. Every time they added a pizza to the order, that user interface would create a pizza object, set the properties of it correctly, and then add that pizza to 
the order object. Is this guy going to return anything? Not really. So it's going to be a void. So what does this statement look like? Well, we need to add something to the array list. How do we add to an array list? There is a method on the array list built in called add. And this adds it simply to the end of the list. All right. So I start out with an empty list before the person has made any orders. I don't have any pizzas. I add the first pizza to the list. They say they want another one. They give me the parameters for that. I add a second pizza to the list, a third pizza, a fourth pizza, and so on. So every time I say add, it simply adds it to the next spot in the list. And because an array list can expand, we don't have to define how big an array list is when we create it. This list can get bigger or it can get smaller. We're not going to implement it, but we could have code to get rid of a pizza. If they went back and said, you know what, I don't want that small mushroom one. We could have code that would allow you to go back and delete that pizza. But we're not going to worry about that today. An array list can expand, though. So every time we add a pizza to that list, it adds that pizza object to the end of the list. All right? So when this is open, when this is started, the, pizzas, the pizza list has zero pizzas in it. We add the first pizza has one. We add the second pizza has two, and so on down the line. Each time we add it, it adds a new pizza object to the end of the list. Now, because we're adding a pizza object, we can do anything we want to to that pizza object that we can do to any other pizza. So what we're going to be doing eventually is we're going to loop through that list of pizzas, and we're going to ask each one of those pizzas, what is your cost? The pizza will tell back what its cost is, and then we'll sum it up. We'll add it up. So that after we've looped through all the pizzas then and determined if it's delivery or pickup, we can then output the, the, the cost of the entire pizza order. All right? So that's where we're headed. But for us to do that first, we have to get the pizzas in the list of pizzas. And that's what this guy does. Now, I'm going to write another... method public double calc total order cost and what we're going to do now is we're going to loop through that array list so if there's one pizza we're going to ask that one pizza what's your cost there's two pizzas, we're going to ask each of the pizzas, what's your cost, and add them together. Three, four, five, however many there are. So I'm going to initialize my cost at zero, right? Here's my loop, and this loop should be familiar to anyone that's done C Sharp or other programming languages. For i equals 0, i less than pizza size, i plus plus. So what we're doing is we're going to loop through the array. i equals 0 means start the variable i having a value of 0. We're going to repeat this loop as long as i is less than the pizza size. And what is pizza sizes? What is another word for pizza sizes? That's the number of pizzas that are on this order. So if I added two pizzas to this, to this order, it would be in that pizza array list under element 0 and element 1. 
Remember, in arrays or array lists, we start numbering with zero. So if I created two pizzas and added them to the order, the first pizza I created would have a, an index or a subscript of zero. The second one would have a value of one. So as long as I, my subscript, is less than the size of that pizza array, I'm going to repeat this, and after I'm done, I'm going to increment I by one. So I'm getting every pizza in the list. So if there were three pizzas, the size would be three. The pizzas would be numbered pizzas sub zero, pizzas sub one, pizzas sub two. And this code would repeat. First time through, I would have a value of, one, of zero. Second time through, I would have a value of one. Third time through, I would have a value of two. At that point, we would increment i. Three is not less than the size of the pizza array. Three is not less than three, so it would drop out of the loop. So this code will execute once for every pizza in the array list. All right. So what do I have to do? I'm going to grab a pointer to each pizza going down the line. I don't have to do that, but I think it makes the code a little clearer. I'm saying give me the pizza in the position I in the array list. So if it's the first time through, it's going to give me pizza zero. Second time through, it's going to give me pizza one. Third time through, it's going to give me pizza two. All right. Am I creating a new pizza object at this point? No. Why, do you, why, why did you know that the answer was no? We don't have the word new. We are simply grabbing a pointer to a pizza that was already created and already put on this list. Now, student, a few students last time asked a couple different variations of the same question of like, why would you ever say P equals Q, Q equals P, and all that? Well, I explained at the time that that was just an exercise that we were doing. But here's a case, practically, where we're grabbing a pointer to a pizza object that already exists. All right? And it is a meaningful thing to do in this particular example because we want to do something with that pizza. So we grab a pointer to that pizza object. And what I can do then is I can say total equals whatever the total was before plus for that particular pizza calculate the cost. So, here's the nice thing. The order doesn't need to know anything about how I price the pizza. The order asks the pizza, how much do you cost? So I don't have to duplicate any logic. I, have to, I don't I have to duplicate the logic of if there's pepperoni, it's an extra dollar, and small is this much, and medium is this much, and so on. That logic is encapsulated. If you remember, we use that term. It's contained completely within the pizza class. So any class that wants to use that, simply ask the pizza, how much do you cost? And the pizza class has that object. So there's no duplication of code here. We have a pizza component that we can put on an order. And we can ask that, how much it costs, how long is it going to take to bake, and so on and so forth. The last thing I want to do is I want to check to see if it's delivery or not. Because if you remember, I said, if it's delivered, then the total cost equals the total plus two dollars. And then finally we return the total cost. Let's go and save this. Sure. Mm -hmm. 
we don't have to say if it equals true because that variable is already a Boolean. All right? If you leave it as it is, right. Because remember what happens in an if statement. In an if statement, whatever's within the parentheses gets evaluated to a Boolean. So usually we have something like if x is greater than y. That's a condition. And the Java virtual machine looks at that condition and decides, is this true? Is this false? And if it's true, it does one thing. If it's false, it does something else. Well, in this case, that is delivery is already a Boolean. It's already true or false. So there really is no evalu evaluation that you need to do. It's already a Boolean. So I can just say, if this, in other words, another way to put it is this statement here is equivalent to saying if this equals true. Yeah. Uh, I mean, other languages as C sharp, sure. Uh, I, I mean, I can't say that for every single language, but um, for all the languages that are sort of done in this style, you certainly can do that. Okay. So, now we have our order class. Let's go and let's test this order class. All right, I already have two pizzas. What I'm going to do, and I'm not worried about the bake time today, What I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to keep these lines of code in here so I can see how much those pizzas cost, so I can do the calculation. I'm going to create an order. Order O1 equals new order. Now, I can't say that. Why can't I say that? because there is a constructor. I've defined a constructor. In fact, I've defined two constructors. One that has two strings and one that accepts three strings. All right? So because I have done that, I cannot use the default empty constructor that has no arguments. You only get that empty argument constructor if you do not define any constructors. So I'm going to define this constructor that accepts the name and the phone number. All right. So I accept the name and the phone number. And it doesn't accept an address. So what does that mean? That means that this is the version of the constructor that will get called, and it's going to default my delivery to false. All right? Because we use the assumption that if they don't supply an address, then it must be for pickup, must not be for delivery. So I've created my order. I can add to that order. the pizza objects I've created here. Because what does this expect? It expects a pizza object. So I can add the first pizza to the order, and I can add the second pizza to the order. And then, I can output the cost for the entire order. And it should give me the sum of those two pizzas. So let's make sure we saved everything, and let's go and compile it.
Okay. All right, I have my three classes here. So I'm going to say Java C unit test dot Java. All right. Can't find the symbol total. What I do wrong? Oh, I called it cost up here and I called it total there. So this should be total. So let's try again. Pizzas dot size. Size has private access in array list. Well, what does that mean? That means that whoever created Java followed the same good programming practices as we did, right? They made their attributes private. So size is an attribute in the array list, but it's private. So I can't access it. What I meant to say is there's actually a size method that would be like a get size that tells me what the size is. So I compile it again and I don't have any errors. Let's go and run this. Pardon me. And it tells me the cost for pizza one is 12, the cost for pizza two is 11. It repeats cost for pizza two, but that should be the total order is $23. So that's correct. Yay. Notice a couple things. Who's doing all the outputting? My unit test class. My business classes don't do any outputting. My business classes simply return values. Why? Because you don't know how you want those outputted. It's the job of whatever program is using those classes to decide how to outputting them. For example, one application may print, uh, may display on the screen that the total cost of the order is $23. Another application might save in a database that the total cost for that order was $23. Or print on a sheet of paper the, the receipt that you're printing out for the customer that the total of the order was $23 or, or, or a, a ticket to the driver saying the total cost of this order is $23. You don't know how output is going to be used and therefore it should be up to every program that uses these classes to decide how to make the output. All right. So therefore my business logic classes are simply returning values. They're not outputting the answers. It's the unit test classes job to sort of take the place of all those other programs that are going to be calling my classes and doing something else with the output. Now, what if we make it a pickup order? And how do we make it a pickup order? Well, we said that if we supply three arguments, if we supply an address, then our application is assuming that it's a pickup. I'm sorry, that it's a delivery. So it should charge the extra two dollars for delivery. I compile it and run it. Now it tells me the total cost for the order is $25. The 11 plus the 12 is 23 plus the two extra dollars because this delivery is um, 25. This is common to have one class be made up of multiple objects. If you think about it, that's how the world is structured, right? If you're going to describe an automobile. An automobile has one engine. That engine is made up of parts itself. Um, 
I don't know anything about cars, but whatever engines are made up of. Batteries, um, spark plugs, cylinders, and so on. A car also has a steering wheel and a steering mechanism. Car has a brake system. Car has, um, what else was I going to say, tires, and so on. So it makes sense if you talk about a component that you're building software-wise, a component is made up of other components. That's very, very, very common. An order at a pizza shop is made up of, among other things, a collection of pizzas. All right, a list of pizzas. So there's the basic information about the order, but there's also a list of pizzas. And how are those represented? They're represented typically as an array list of objects. All right? And if we want to know something about the individual object, if we want to know, for example, the price of the order of the pizza, we don't recalculate that order. We don't have logic in the order to recalculate the price of a pizza. We simply ask the pizza object, how much do you cost? In object-oriented terms, that's called delegating. You ask one class, and that class turns and asks other, other objects. Or you ask one object for a value, it goes and asks other objects. So for example, in the car example, you know, if I were to ask the automobile, you know, uh, what kind of battery do you have? The car would ask the battery, what kind of battery are you? And then whatever answer it gets, it's going to return back to you. All right? So I ask what the price of the order is. A good portion of the price of the order is the price of each individual pizza added together. So that's what the logic in the order class does. It goes through each pizza, asks each pizza for its cost, and totals it up. Then we have the extra possible fee if it's a delivery. So we add an extra $2 if it's delivered. So it's not entirely the sum of the individual pizzas, but in large part, it's the sum of the individual pizzas. We're going to do stuff like this a lot. And I understand this could be confusing, so we'll go over this um, again. We'll also talk about this, how this relates to, um, I think, your fourth programming assignment, where you take the student tuition calculation, instead of giving the number of credit hours, which was an oversimplification, you're going to create a list of courses. And then you're going to loop through and add up how many credit hours the student is taking, just like I went through and added up the cost of each pizza. So your lab four is going to contain this sort of logic as well. Any questions about this? Yes? Well, again, everything that we do in the unit test, remember the role of the unit test. The role of the unit test is to test out our business logic um, classes. So it's OK to hard code in them. And what you're going to do is you're going to hard code certain test scenarios. So you're going to make certain classes. You're going to make certain students. You're going to add certain classes to one student, certain classes to another student, and so on, so that you can thoroughly test those classes. So the assumption is that we would this would be attached to a GUI. Like, we would not have, if we actually wrote this pizza system, we would not have a unit test class. We would have a screen where the person would enter in the name, the phone number, the address. A little screen where they would create each pizza and add it to the order. All right? So until we talk about GUIs, you never have to worry about inputting the data. It will all be hard-coded as test cases in your unit test class. Other questions? All right, we'll see you up in lab.